Hanshan, Untitled. I climb the road to Cold Mountain, the road to Cold Mountain that never ends. The valleys are long and strewn with boulders, the streams broad and banked with thick grass. Moss is slippery, though no rain has fallen. Pines sigh, but it isn't the wind. Who can break from the snares of the world and sit with me among the white clouds? So we continue with yet another poem by Han Shan. The poem we have just read, just like the one we read the day before, is not so unusual perhaps in its... uh, and its subject matter, uh, although it does connect very, very, very straightly with you know the the, the Buddhist uh, the Buddhist sort of topic and imagery we would expect in 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 a Chan Buddhist poet. So as you as you have perceived, the topic of this poem is abandoning the world, the retired life, the hermetic life. That is a common enough topic also in scholar official poetry, but usually when it appears there, it has this. At the very least, this playful subtext of a Buddhist or sometimes Taoist uh, abandonment of the dusty world. And, and here we would feel that it's probably more sincere. Interesting aspect is that this poem basically is a call, a description of, and a call to retire to Cold Mountain, which, as we've mentioned before, is the source of the poet Han Shan's name, Cold Mountain. In classical Chinese is Han Shan. This was a mountain in uh, in the area of of Zhejiang, in the eastern coast of China. And uh, you know, like a lot of holy mountains in the Chinese tradition, was a place that was um, rife with uh, probably Buddhist uh, and Taoist uh, ascetics. And some of these mountains also had a lot of of Buddhist temples and institutions. And we've talked a lot of times about how mountains have this religious, symbolic uh, aspect in, in traditional Chinese culture. And even among the Confucians, they transmit this idea of farsight, of insight, that can be achieved in high places. Anyway, so as we say, the poem is pretty straightforward. Uh, you could divide it into three parts if you wish. Uh, so, so it's a pretty mm, conventional liu shi, pentasyllabic liu shi. The first couplet sets the scene. Basically, it uh, it places us uh, so on the road to Cold Mountain on its never-ending path. Then the two middle couplets, which would be the parallelistic ones, and I, I think the parallelism is is visible in the translation, describe the mountain, its sights, its numinous uh, subtext, and finally the last couplet is an invitation, a rhetorical question in which the poetic persona asks the reader to abandon the red dust of the world and to join him in retiring and meditating in Cold Mountain. So, as usual, let's take a look at the poem uh, after this general depiction and description of its subject matter. Let's take a brief look at it, couplet by couplet. And altogether, I would say it's a pretty straightforward poem. Mm, Perhaps the imagery in the central couplets, which has probably Buddhist overtones, is, is not completely transparent, but, you know, it's... A simple poem calling for for the retired life. First couplet. I climb the road to cold mountain. The road to cold mountain that never ends. So, as as I said, this is the introduction. The poet, the poetic persona is climbing the mountain. In the original Chinese, you don't have personal pronouns here, probably. So you have something like climb road, cold mountain, or something of the sort. And... Interesting thing, the road to Cold Mountain that never ends. Why does the road never end? I imagine this is not meant to be interpreted literally. The road is never ending because, I don't know, perhaps it represents the fact that uh, there's a perennial um, road from abandoning the world to to going to places of meditation, asketism, and uh, breaking the snares of the world. This is a never-ending road which every generation and every person might experience. Yeah, the, the, the pull towards abandoning the, the, the road of office, of power, of glory, of attachment to the material realm, and of following the other road, the road of transcendence, the road of breaking the wheel of samsara, the road of going to me- places of meditation, 
and of, 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 of cleanliness and pure thought. So, so already this couplet um, has a literal meaning, like, uh, like in going to the mountain, but this, the road that never ends, although it could hint at, 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 at very long, big roads, taking you to Cold Mountain, I think has this, this, this overtone. Second couplet, the valleys are long and strewn with boulders, the streams broad and banked with thick grass. So the parallelism is very clear here. Valleys, streams, long, broad, strewn, banked, boulders, grass. Uh, so this is descriptive. So, you know, uh, how does this mountain look like? Well, valleys and streams are, and boulders are typical objects, are typical elements that, are, that, that appear in descriptive poems about about um, about mountain spaces. So yeah, we have long valleys, we have rocks, we have streams, we have thick grass. So mm, nice place, slightly locus amoenus. So this is a beautiful natural place, devoid of human presence, or at least of any explicit or very easily visible human presence. The next couplet, moss is slippery, though no rain has fallen. Pine sigh, but it isn't the wind. Again, the, the parallelism is quite clear. Moss, pine, slippery, uh, sighing, uh, no, wind, no rain, no wind. So again, we, we get a description. In this case, in the, the camera seems to zoom in. Instead of the valleys and the streams, we focus on two objects, moss and pines. And uh, moss and pines, of course, are, are, are natural objects, but they have lots of uh, reverberations, lots of connotations. Pines generally evoke evergreenness, um, loyalty, steadfastness, unchangeability through the seasons. Uh, moss also has its own connotations of freshness, of, 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 of greenness. So, so we have these elements which we would expect to encounter in a mountain, moss and pines, but they have this slightly unusual tinge to them. Why is the moss slippery, even if no rain has fallen? Why are the pines sighing uh, when there isn't any wind? I imagine this should be interpreted as, um, as, as this idea, which is very Buddhist, although it's also present in medieval um, European poetry, that you know nature is the great book of, 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 of the deity, and uh, it, it preaches to you. So, of course, Buddhists don't have the same focus on the deity, but they do have this idea that the world... Mm, that you can the, the lessons of, of impermanence of samsara uh, can be learned can be gleaned from the world itself so these pine trees that seem to be whispering something that is not caused by the wind this moss that is slippery even though even though no rain has fallen they're probably conveying a message of of a buddhist uh, of buddhist impermanence of of buddhist uh, <coughs> Of, 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 you know, Buddhist um, renunciation. It's, the Chan sect also has some, some additional, uh, unusual Buddhist views, like the idea that the, 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 the material realm, samsara, includes nirvana in itself. It's just a matter of looking correctly. So, so maybe here in this mountain you can look correctly, you can try to listen to the sound and feel the unusual... I'm <coughs> sorry the unusual slipperiness of the moss as, as indications, as messages, as, as, as hieroglyphs that hint towards uh, the essential Buddhist truth and, and uh, the stepping stones that uh, the person climbing, walking around cold mountain can use for trying to achieve transcendence. Finally, the last couplet, which has the rhetorical question, <coughs> um, you know, directly... Um, asks the reader to, you know, just move away from his passive reading to, you know, to, to go into this sort of place, but also this sort of mental space of, of, of transcending, of renouncing the world. Who can break from the snares of the world and sit with me among the white clouds? So white clouds typically associated with hermits and with mountains. So Han Shan tells the reader, you should do this too. Can you escape the traps, the ensnares of the world? that keep you tied to the phenomenal realm and to the painfulness of incarnation. Can you transcend this and join me in this mountain that will help you achieve liberation? So, altogether, pretty pretty conventional but interesting uh, take on, on, on 
on hermitism, which is quite a common theme in classical Chinese poetry.